Professor Clements with you as uh, we move on to chapter 29 in the OpenStax College Physics textbook, Introduction to Quantum Physics, Quantum Mechanics or Wave Mechanics. We've seen some strange things with special relativity on how the universe behaves at high speed that in a way that we're not used to because we live our lives with low speed situations, low speed compared to the speed of light. Now we're going to investigate uh, the small side of the universe and quantum mechanics as it applies to small objects, atoms. Um, talk about energy levels and talk about light again and how light interacts with electrons and the photoelectric effect. We'll talk about the energy as a function of the frequency of light and we'll talk about the momentum that is in uh, a photon. So again we're going through modern physics as we uh, go through this material and uh, this quantum mechanics is going to have again strange results when we're on small size scales, sm sizes that we're not used to dealing with. Um, we're going to find that there we cannot allow all possible energies. The energy will come in packages and that's kind of the quantum idea, the package of uh, energy. Um, light will not always act as a wave, and we'll have a connection between uh, energy and frequency. Frequency depends on wavelength, so there's also a connection there, but the typical uh, calculation involves a frequency directly. And then kind of a strange result, uh, first semester, we calculated momentum as mass times velocity. Light does not have any mass, but it does possess momentum. So we'll start exploring some of these. And the uh, quantum mechanics that developed in the 1920s um, gained the ability to better explain the energies that are found in atoms and the uh, probability of locating an electron in an atom. Um, so we'll talk about that in a future session. And just a fun little photograph here. Um, these creatures live near hydrothermal vents deep in the ocean and uh, much magnified view using an electron microscope. The electron acts as a wave and there's a microscope uh, that's built using that principle. Uh, so give you a nice detail of uh, a hydrothermal worm. So let's talk about the black body spectra. That kind of got the ball rolling investigating quantum effects. In the uh, late 1800s, uh, the spectrum was measured for black bodies, uh, black body being an object that absorbs all the light that hits the black body. These objects also emit light, and it turns out that the uh, spectrum, how much energy at a certain wavelength, the spectrum depends on the temperature, not on the elements that make up the black body. And this black body effect occurs for solids, for liquids, and if a gas is very dense, um, it'll send out light with a spectrum that uh, is similar to the black body spectrum. Not totally identical, but very similar. So in the late 1800s, the uh, spectrum was measured and of course physicists like to uh, generate uh, graphs and uh, interpret what's going on. So the uh, a measurement of energy off to the left here, wavelength along here, and you can see the wavelength getting shorter off to the left. That's the violet end of the spectrum. Um, we can run light bulbs at different temperatures, controlling the amount of current going through the wire. There's a different amount of joule heating in that wire. And if we uh, crank up the, uh, uh, the light bulb above really 2,000, uh, kind of substantially above 2,000 Kelvin, then we more simulate sunlight. This graph also tells you why um, countries are seeking to ban incandescent lights, lights that have a hot wire, the type that Edison invented. Here's our visible spectrum that's useful to our eye. Here's the light emitted by a wire at 2000 Kelvin temperature and there's a lot of energy out in the infrared 
that is not useful for helping us see the real purpose of light bulbs. Um, so that's wasted energy out here. And some other light bulb designs uh, minimize the wasted energy. That's why they're uh, going to replace the incandescent. So the black body spectrum is measured. It's uh, this green line, essentially. And on this graph, we've got wavelength increasing off to the right. The short wavelength is back here. The ultraviolet wavelengths are back here. And there was a, a way of calculating energy versus wavelength for the emission of light, the rayleigh genes law. And what you'll notice here, this classical physics law, the rayleigh genes law, uh, matches somewhat at the very long wavelengths, but as the wavelength decreases, this graph, this classical physics red line, continues to rise and definitely does not match the experimental data. Um, that, that's a huge problem, as we have this uh, experiment where our science is based on experiments, and we have an experiment that's giving us a result, this green line, measuring the energy versus wavelength, and we have a theory that does not match. So what do you do in that situation? You don't stop uh, trying to find a different theory. Here's the data. You have to do some work and try to find some equation that matches the data. And that was done by Planck. And uh, Planck was able to come up with an equation that matches the data. He had to assume that there were oscillators in the black body that had discrete energy values, um, quantized energy values. So that uh, was new, a new kind of concept that all energies were not allowed. Only certain energies were allowed for the oscillator. But when uh, Planck uh, assumed that, he was able to derive a formula that matched the experiment. Um, so we have Planck here, working in his office perhaps, um, but sort of a contemporary of Einstein. Um, again, black bodies, um, if we again increase the temperature more to 6,000 kelvins, now we're seeing a peak of this black body in the visible spectrum. Still a lot of wasted energy out here. And as the temperature goes down, the peak shifts towards the infrared. Um, so that was another characteristic that needed some explanation. There was a, a relationship between the temperature of the black body and where the peak of this uh, curve occurs. And Planck's uh, derivation of the formula does produce uh, the calculation that gives the correct peak. Um, so the black body has this continuous spectrum. We have light at all the wavelengths. You can see that the amount of energy goes up as the temperature goes up. None of these lines cross, though so there uh, is a lot more energy being emitted at the 6,000 Kelvin versus uh, 3,000, let's say. And um, in fact, it's 16 times more power. The amount of power goes as temperature to the fourth power. So we're doubling the temperature to go to 6,000 Kelvin. And we then would have two raised to the fourth power. That happens to be 16. So there's a lot more power being generated. There's more energy at every wavelength along this black body as the temperature increases. Um, so the black body spectrum, a little summary of what's happening here. Planck was able to derive the formula. If he made an assumption that the oscillators in the black body were quantized for their energy, um, just certain energies being allowed, the oscillator could not contain all possible energy values. Um, so quantized, only certain values are allowed. Uh, we've run across this a little bit before when we talked about charges. If you remember, there's this fundamental package of charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, either plus for the proton, minus for the electron. And other objects that have more charge, it would just be an integer times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The charge is quantized. It comes in certain values. 
And then the description of the peak of those curves I was showing you, that's Veen's Law, and the wavelength where the peak um, energy output is, 2.9 times 10 to the minus 3 meters, divided by the temperature in kelvins. So 2.9 times 10 to the minus 3 meters divided by the temperature in Kelvin. So if, if you say the temperature is 1,000 Kelvin, what would be the uh, peak wavelength? If we have 1,000 Kelvin, that would be dividing by 1,000. That's going to change this 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 6. So 2.9 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. That's still longer wavelength than visible light. Uh, that's into the, like 4 times 10 to the minus 7 category. Then the power emitted by the black body is the area of the black body multiplied by temperature to the fourth power. It's proportional to that. There's some other constants out in front that we're not going to uh, discuss. But the power is very sensitive to the temperature. Uh, it's temperature to the fourth power that determines the, uh, the power emitted by the black body. Um, so this was an unusual kind of uh, result for the classical physicists, uh, for Planck. Um, it took him a while to come around to the view that this was correct. It took everybody a while to come around to the view that this was correct, that there was actual quantization of the, um, of the energies, uh, but the energies are, are in packages. It's a true result and leads to some other considerations that have been confirmed. Um, in looking at the, uh, the spectra, the black body spectra, it is a continuous spectrum, light at all wavelengths. Uh, we also have emission spectrum that were studied in the 1800s. And the study here led to further understanding about energy in the atom, and that energy in the atom is also quantized. Uh, so we can produce this emission spectrum if we use a thin gas. Not a solid, not a liquid, not a dense gas, but a thin gas. The gas will emit light at just certain wavelengths, certain frequencies, and those turn out to be certain energies. And these uh, emission spectra, the line spectra, are fingerprints for elements. Each element has a different pattern of, uh, of these spectral lines. Um, another one here for uh, showing oxygen, the emission spectrum for oxygen. And again, you can see it's a little more complicated than the previous ones. Um, but the uh, understanding of the black body then prepared the world and prepared Einstein for description of the photoelectric effect, the solution for some problems with another experiment in the 1800s, late 1800s, that could not be explained by classical physics. And that's this photoelectric effect that if we shine light on a metal, if the light is short enough wavelength, and that means high frequency, then that light will carry enough energy and will get an electron released from the metal. And the green light also has enough energy. The red light does not have enough energy, no electron being ejected here. And this slide is calculated, the uh, energy values and the units of electron volts. We talked about that briefly uh, earlier in the semester. But the electron volt, that's the energy an electron would require if it moves through one volt of potential difference. And the energy is tied to uh, uh, the wavelength and tied to the frequency. So this experiment had been done in the 1800s. Uh, Einstein explained it in 1905 in one of his papers. And his explanation uh, led to the Nobel Prize for his explanation of photoelectric effect. And the observation here is that if we shine light on a metal, the wavelength has to be blue enough, has to be short enough, to get any electrons coming off of the, uh, of the metal. If we increase the brightness of the light and it's short enough wavelength, then we will get more electrons. And that's in agreement with classical physics, but um, the experiment disagrees with classical physics. And classical physics would said, just wait long enough with this red light shining on the metal. Eventually, the electron will pick up enough energy and will leave the metal. That is false. Um, we do this experiment, red light will not cause electrons to jump out of the metal. 
but green light, blue light will cause some metals to behave this way. Uh, different metals hold on to their electrons with different energies, so it takes uh, sometimes shorter wavelength than green light to cause the metal to uh, to release an electron. Um, classical physics would say that we could just wait long enough and the, the waves will eventually pile up enough energy to release electrons. Uh, the quantum mechanics uh, explanation here as to what is happening it tells us that that does not happen. Um, the electron comes off immediately when light of the proper wavelength shines on the metal. It's not a matter of waiting for a hundred or a thousand of these wave peaks to come in and hit the metal. Um, if the frequency of the light is appropriate, then electron is released right away. There's no time delay. The energy of the electron coming off is proportional to the frequency of the light. That's something that classical physics can't uh, deal with, but that's the experimental result. And Einstein's explanation um, agrees with that result. Um, drawing here, so we have some light coming in. It would be better if this was blue light rather than red light. Um, there are more metals that show this photoelectric effect um, if you use blue light. If you use red light, there's still some metals that will behave this way, but they're, it's rare. Um, and there's a little bit misleading here. Uh, three bundles of energy coming into the metal, only two electrons coming out. Um, that would be the case if one of these uh, photons is lagging behind the others. But if there are three um, localized packages of energy photons hitting the metal, then there would be three electrons coming off uh, in most, uh, most drawings that you would see. But Einstein reasoned that, kind of following Planck, that there's an energy, Planck's constant times frequency, can be calculated to give that energy, and the light, instead of acting like a wave when it's going to be absorbed, the light acts like a localized particle. It doesn't have mass, but we could call it a particle, and better call it a photon. A photon is a sort of uh, concentrated energy, localized energy, and the light as it strikes the metal, Einstein said the light energy is not spread out like a wave hitting a beach and uh, pushing grains of sand around, but instead the wave energy is concentrated in one photon, is absorbed by one electron, and then that electron leaves the metal. And Einstein developed an equation. We'll practice with that in class uh, for calculating the kinetic energy of the electron. It's really conservation of energy. The energy of the light is calculated with Planck's constant times the frequency of the light. There's some uh, energy required to break the electron free from the metal. Very often we call that the work function. And then what's left over becomes kinetic energy of the electron. So we've got an energy supply coming in, the photon. We subtract the energy required to break the electron free. And what we're left with is the kinetic energy of the electron as it uh, leaves the metal. So that's the photoelectric effect. Light, photons, cause an electric effect. The electrons get released here. And this is the basis for solar cells, for uh, a calculator at uh, converting that sunlight into electricity is, uh, is what happens. Um, so let's go a little further with this. Here's a device that uh, is useful for letting light fall on this metal. The metal is chosen to be such that it does not tightly hold on to the electrons. The light coming in can easily eject an electron and then it can be gathered by the central wire. If we put a little positive voltage on the central wire, the electrons coming out of the metal will be drawn there, and we can get a current and do uh, studies of photoelectric effect. So here's a flashlight. In previous chapters, we drew the light as a wave while it's traveling, and that would be a little bit better here to draw waves. Um, but when the light is emitted, when the light is absorbed, it acts as a more localized um, photon, we'll call it, more localized energy. 
um, in the emission process and in the absorption process. There are huge numbers of photons in a beam of light. Um, the photons have uh, individually small energies and a beam of light out of a flashlight has um, a huge energy compared to the energy of one photon of light. So here's a, a graph of the photoelectric effect and what happens. Uh, there's a certain frequency required before we get any electrons coming out of the metal. This vertical scale is kinetic energy of the electrons. Um, but once we have the light blue enough, and this is a graph of frequency on the horizontal scale, so red light would be out here, uh, yellow, green, blue, uh, violet, ultraviolet, x-rays, increasing energy as we go off to the right here as frequency increases. And Einstein came up with the description of the kinetic energy of the electron in that it's the energy of the photon minus the binding energy, the energy that the metal is holding on to the electron with. Um, so this is our equation for photoelectric effect. Planck's constant, frequency of the light, that gives us the energy of the photon. And then binding energy is different for different metals, uh, depending on how tightly they hold on to their electrons. But this was predicted by Einstein. It was confirmed um, in around 1912. I forget the exact date. But the uh, um, experiments confirm what Einstein predicted for the behavior, the kinetic energy of the electrons, uh, confirmed by Millikan, a person who was instrumental in finding the charge on the electron. Um, Oh, let's move into energy across the electromagnetic spectrum. We, we studied the spectrum just a little bit, and now we're going to put more emphasis on uh, frequency and energy. The, the very highest frequency are the gamma rays, and then x-rays, then ultraviolet light, and then our visible spectrum. Again, just a tiny portion of the electromagnetic spectrum is visible light, and the blue light is higher frequency than the red light or the yellow light. Um, to the left of the red part of the visible spectrum we have infrared and you can see the uh, frequency is way down now. It's 10 to the 12th um, cycles per second for the infrared. We were back at 10 to the 24th for the gamma rays. And again the energy of the light uh, is proportional to the frequency. Uh, the energy is equal to Planck's constant times frequency. and we have a, a very high frequency, very energetic photons off to the right. Uh, what's in common with X-rays, ultraviolet light, and gamma rays? What do they have in common and uh, in interacting with a person? Well, they can cause something like sunburn. They can damage. They can ionize materials. They carry enough energy to ionize uh, atoms, and that uh, can damage. Uh, the molecules that are in a human cell and uh, you know, damage our, our skin and other, other structures that this ultraviolet light or x-rays or gamma rays impinges us on. So high energy, high frequency, low frequency, low energy. So microwaves, radio waves, and it's uh, safe, we believe, to uh, have radio waves uh, strike your body. They're low energy. These uh, off to the left of the visible spectrum, they do not have enough energy in general to ionize atoms. So they're, they're safer regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. I hope you have a healthy respect for X-rays and even healthier respect for gamma rays. We'll study more about them uh, in the future. Uh, but if someone gives you the wavelength, we can calculate the frequency because speed of light equals wavelength times frequency. Speed of light equals wavelength times frequency. So if you're given the uh, wavelength, you can calculate the frequency. And then the energy is Planck's constant times the frequency. And you can calculate the energy. You can see the numbers up here. Millions of electron volts for the gamma rays. A uh, fraction of an electron volt in the infrared out into the microwave uh, realm. Uh, X-rays uh, can pass through soft tissue, give us a, uh, a picture of someone's hand and rings that are on fingers externally and 
uh, having a uh, little drawing tool. Um, so x-rays can be useful in uh, reducing surgeries because the doctors can look inside your body with the x-rays. X-rays are produced with uh, electrons traveling high speed, striking a metal and slowing down. We talked about this with the uh, uh, chapter on light, and Maxwell's equations. Um, light is generated when a charge is accelerated uh, sometimes. We're going to modify that in a future chapter, but that's how this device does work. The electrons moving high speed uh, strike this metal and slow down and we get an x-ray uh, uh, coming out as a result. Um, the x-ray spectrum is interesting. Um, there's a certain maximum frequency, maximum energy that relates to the energy of the electrons coming into the metal. And there are these peaks, kind of spectral lines, again, but in the x-ray spectrum. Uh, they are caused for the same reason as the spectral lines in the visible spectrum, uh, the emission lines. Uh, we're not going to study them uh, too much. Just know that uh, x-rays are produced when electron strikes the material and slows down. Um, light itself, here's sunlight and a drawing of the tail of a comet. When comets come near the sun, their ices melt and release gas and dust into space. And the um, comet can form two tails, a blue ion tail and a more white reflecting sunlight uh, dust tail for uh, for the comet, come d dust and gas coming out of the ices. The dust tail is what we want to concentrate on today. The sunlight impinges on the dust. Light turns out to carry momentum, and the sunlight can push the dust particles uh, into their own orbit around the sun. Um, the ion tail is interesting because it interacts with the magnetic field that the sun possesses. Though so comets were uh, kind of big wind socks uh, up through the 1950s before spacecraft uh, were available to probe the conditions inside our solar system. And the comets are still useful for, because uh, we don't have satellites every place in the solar system, so the tail of the comet is useful in uh, giving us conditions. So Einstein says that light acts like a localized energy in the photoelectric effect. In the 1920s, there was recognized another effect, the Compton effect, that when gamma rays come in and interact with an electron in an atom, they can knock that electron out of the atom, ionize. The electron will come out in a certain direction, the gamma ray will come out in a certain direction. There's a relationship between them. And if you notice, the wavelength has been reduced here. If the wavelength has been reduced, then the frequency goes down, and we have less energy. And the conservation of energy is occurring here. The gamma ray brings in a certain amount of energy. The electron flying off has some kinetic energy, and we have the remaining energy of the original gamma ray in another, most likely a gamma ray, that leaves the, uh, leaves the atom. But this collision nature uh, tells physicists that the light is localized. The light energy is localized here and making a collision with the electron. Uh, a wave would affect all of these electrons, uh, or if the wave energy was too diluted, wouldn't affect any of them dramatically. But the fact that we get an electron ejected from the atom is evidence that light acts like a particle. It's a collision, essentially, process. Um, another view of it here, with uh, light coming in, striking an electron, the electron picks up uh, kinetic energy, and the light moves out away from the collision spot with a lower frequency than coming in. We have uh, certain energy here. Some of the energy goes to kinetic energy of the electron. The remaining energy is the um, energy of the gamma ray, the light that's uh, coming out. The photons do have momentum. They can have a collision and uh, cause this uh, electron to move away from the atom. So this can be taken advantage of, the fact that light has momentum, to use a sail. You know, 
sailboats sail on the water as wind pushes on the sail. And there is in development sails for uh, carrying satellites around our solar system. Sunlight is free. We have to pay to load to launch chemical fuel into orbit and then into our solar system. Um, so the solar sails, they provide slower travel, but they uh, would be cheaper because we don't have to carry along a lot of fuel. The sunlight is the fuel, and there are no cloudy days in space. Um, so this has already been accomplished. Um, a small satellite and sail was deployed in 2011 just for sort of a proof of concept that it can be done. And there are larger models scheduled to be uh, uh, put into space in 2015. So sunlight will strike the scale, the sail, and uh, push the uh, spacecraft uh, through the solar system. There is some uh, navigation possible and the way you tilt the, uh, the sail and, uh, and so forth, but uh, we're not going to go into that. Just know the basic fact. Light carries momentum, though when that light reflects off of the sail, there has been a change in momentum. And Newton's original second law tells us the average force equals the change in momentum divided by the time for that change to take place. A change in momentum is associated with force. And the uh, solar sail will be pushed through the solar system by sunlight. Okay, by sunlight. Um, so quantum mechanics, uh, dealing with the quantized energy levels and uh, uh, the photo a photoelectric effect followed on that by saying the light was quantized. Uh, Planck analyzed the black body spectrum with quantized energies for oscillators. Einstein picked up on that and said we have these packages of energy and light that cause the electron to be ejected from the metal. Um, and Einstein's uh, work uh, verified on the, the graph that you saw. Um, and the concept uh, of this package of light is certainly accepted. Um, light has two natures. Light is a wave when it's traveling, but it's a particle when it's emitted and, uh, and absorbed. And particle, in quotes, doesn't have any mass, but it's localized. It's not all spread out like a wave um, when, it's, uh, when it's interacting. Um, and then we have... Uh, you know, further evidence with the Compton effect that uh, light is localized and carries momentum, can engage in collisions, and some interesting applications uh, are being developed for that. So you should keep reading and uh, you know, trying to stretch your imagination here as to uh, what the world of small size is like. Realize it is different. You're going to have to pay close attention to what you read and you should be asking questions to uh, just clean up little misunderstandings that, uh, that might be present.